Welcome back guys. Today we're going to be looking into equilibrium, including reversible reactions, shifting equilibrium using Le Chatelier's principle and how different factors affect equilibrium. So let's get into it. First, let's talk about reversible reactions. For example, here we have a normal reaction where the reactants A and B react to form products C and D. We use a normal one-ended arrow to represent these. But some reactions can be reversible. This is when products can react together to reform the reactants. So in this example, that would be C and D reacting together to form A and B. We represent these with a double-ended arrow to show the reaction can go both ways. The top part of the arrow pointing to the right represents the original forward reaction and the bottom arrow pointing to the left represents the backward or reverse reaction. A real life example of this is with ammonium chloride where if you heat the solid ammonium chloride up it breaks down to form ammonia and hydrogen chloride gas in the forward reaction. But when you cool the products back down the backward reaction occurs and ammonium chloride is reformed. Now, when any reaction occurs, heat energy is always either given out to the surroundings or taken in. We call these exothermic or endothermic reactions. In a reversible reaction, the rule is if the forward reaction is exothermic and releases heat, it means the backward reaction is endothermic and takes in heat. And inversely, if the forward was endothermic, the backwards would be exothermic. The value of the amount of energy taken in or given out is always the same in both directions, but they just have opposite symbols. So if the forward reaction had an energy change of plus 56 kilojoules per mole, the backward reaction would be minus 56 kilojoules per mole. For example, we can look at blue crystals of hydrated copper sulfate, where the word hydrated just means copper sulfate containing water molecules. You can heat this up and provide energy from the surroundings to cause the water in the copper sulfate to be released. This is an endothermic reaction and forms water and anhydrous copper sulfate, where the word anhydrous just means without water. Similarly, for the backward reaction, you can just add water to the anhydrous copper sulfate in an exothermic reaction to reform the hydrated copper sulfate. So what's equilibrium? Equilibrium occurs when you have a reversible reaction in a closed system. That just means nothing is able to enter or leave the system. Let's say we had a reversible reaction of reactants A and B forming products C and D. We'll take the reactants as purple particles and the products as orange. At the start of the reaction, you only have reactant molecules. But as these move around and collide with each other, they react to form the products C and D. This means the number of reactant particles decrease and the number of product particles increase. In a normal reaction, this will keep going until all the particles become orange products and the reaction ends. A reversible reaction, however, never ends because as soon as the products are formed, they can then react with each other to reform the reactants. So what you have in the system is two reactions happening at the same time, the forward and the backward reaction. And as the reactions go on, they will reach a point where both the forward and the backward reaction happen at the same speed. At this point, we say the reaction has reached equilibrium, which is defined as when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction in a closed system. At this point, the concentration of the reactants and products stop changing, or in this diagram, it would mean that the overall number of orange and purple particles stay the same. It's important to note that at this point, the reaction has not finished. The forward and the backward reaction are always still happening and the concentrations are just staying constant because the products are being formed at the same rate that the reactants are being formed. So let's look into shifting equilibrium. Once a reversible reaction has reached equilibrium and the concentration of the products and reactants stop changing, it's possible to change the position of the equilibrium to alter the concentrations of the reactants and products. The equilibrium can either be shifted to the left or to the right. Shifting the equilibrium to the left towards the reactant side causes the amount of reactants to increase which in turn decreases the amount of products. This means that in our mixture of particles the number of purple reactant particles would increase and the orange product particles would decrease. And inversely, shifting the equilibrium to the right will cause the amount of products to increase and the amount of reactants to decrease which will result in more orange product particles. You can cause a reaction in equilibrium to shift by changing the conditions it's in. For example, changing the temperature of the mixture by heating up the flask. 
you can predict which direction a reaction will shift by using Le Chatelier's principle. This states that if you change the conditions of a reversible reaction in equilibrium, the equilibrium will shift to try and counteract the change. So for example, if you were to increase the temperature of a reaction by heating it, the equilibrium will shift in a direction that will counteract the increase and decrease it as much as possible. By using this, you can change the amount of your product and reactants by changing the conditions of your reversible reaction. So now let's look at the factors affecting equilibrium position. There are three factors that can change whether a reaction lies on the left of an equilibrium with more reactants or on the right with more products. These are temperature, pressure and concentration. So for temperature, the direction that equilibrium shifts depends on whether the reactions are exothermic or endothermic. You can only ever have these two scenarios. If the temperature of the system is increased, the equilibrium will shift to try and counteract the change and decrease the temperature back down. So it will shift to the endothermic side because in endothermic reactions, temperature always decrease. Whether this is to the left or to the right depends on what scenario you have. If the temperature of the system decreases, the opposite will happen, where the equilibrium will try to increase the temperature so it will shift to the exothermic side because these are reactions where temperature increases. So if we were to look at a real life example and we're told that the following equation had a forward reaction that was exothermic, we can say that we have this scenario. If we were to increase the temperature of the reaction, the equilibrium will shift to the left-hand side. So in your equilibrium mixture, the amount of nitrogen and hydrogen would increase and the amount of NH3 would decrease. Now for pressure, the direction the equilibrium shifts depends on the number of molecules either side of the equation. The reason this is affected by pressure is because the pressure of a gas changes depending on the number of molecules or particles you have in a system. A container with a lot of molecules will give a large pressure, but a container with fewer molecules will give a smaller pressure. There are three scenarios you can have. One where you have more reactant molecules on the left, another where you have more product molecules on the right, and the final one where you have the same number of molecules on both sides of the equation. You can tell the number of molecules a reaction has from the equations where you can look at the big balancing numbers. In this example, the left hand side has one and three molecules, so that's four in total. And on the right hand side, you have two molecules. Therefore, you have this scenario. So if you have an equilibrium reaction and you increase its pressure, the equilibrium will try to counteract that change and reduce the pressure back to normal by shifting to the side with fewer moles. And if pressure decreases, it will try to increase the pressure back by going to the side with more moles. So in this example, if you were to increase the pressure of the container with the equilibrium reaction, the equilibrium will try to counteract the change by shifting it to the right. This means the amount of NH3 will increase and the amount of N2 and H2 will decrease. Our final factor is concentration, which works differently to the other two. For example, if you were to increase the concentration of reactant A in the following reaction, you would have disrupted the equilibrium balance, meaning the reaction is no longer in equilibrium for a short amount of time. When this happens, the reaction responds and gets itself back into equilibrium and counteracts the change that was made to it. So in this example, it would shift to the right to reduce the increase in reactant A, which will in turn increase the amount of products. If you were to decrease the amount of reactants, the opposite would occur and the equilibrium would shift to the left. And you can use the same principle for changing product concentration. If you were to increase the concentration of product D, the equilibrium would shift to the left and counteract the change. And if you were to decrease it, it would shift to the right. And that's it for that topic, guys. If you like this video and want to see more, don't forget to drop a like and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.